Tom here from Lawrence Systems. We're going to dive into SyncThing, a continuous file synchronization program that is open source and free and lets you take care of your data privately without third parties being involved. If you want to learn more about me and my company, head over to lawrencesystems.com. If you'd like to hire a sharp project, there's a hire us button up at the top. If you want to support this channel in other ways, some affiliate links down below to get you deals and discounts on products and services we talk about on this channel. And I've talked about sync thing uh, starting maybe three or four years ago uh, when I started doing videos about it, but we've been using it for, well, probably a little longer than that. I'm trying to remember, I was trying to find the exact date I started using it, but a long time. And I've loved watching a project come together, all the features it has, and uh, it's it's been a really great tool. That being said, I haven't done an updated video on how to use it. Easy to use, powerful, portable, simple, uh, private, fully encrypted authentication options, including uh, external authentication like LDAP. I'm not going to get into some of the real advanced features, but yes, they have it. Yes, they have extensive documentation uh, in here for sync thing, but I wanted to walk you through the functional parts of getting it started because even after you read the documentation, uh, sometimes people are they have trouble with some of the concepts of how sync thing works. And that's why I wanted to walk you through step-by-step step of both how to set this up on Windows and how to set this up on a Linux machine. Uh, the prerequisite for Windows, have Windows. Um, Windows 10, pretty simple. The prerequisite for running this on Linux, just have Linux set up. I'm running it on Debian 10, but it supports a huge number of uh, platforms. So let's go ahead and go over to the download section. And it, sync, it has sync thing that when currently we're looking at version 1.42, uh, we have OpenBSD support, NetBSD, Dragonfly BSD, Mac OS support, FreeBSD, Linux, many different flavors, even including compilations for MIPS and S390X, even some obscure stuff in here that you don't see as often, but they have it. So they've got a wide range. So yes, if you're wondering if this will work on like your Raspberry Pis, uh, yes, ARM support in here as well. There is an Android package. I have not used it or tested it, but I do know it exists um, to my knowledge, and I could be wrong about this. I've not seen anything for iPhone for those wondering. And we're going to focus on doing it for in Linux here. Uh, this will be the Linux install we follow, but first we're going to set it up on Windows so we have two machines that we can set up and get going at it. Now, this is what it looks like installed. I've got it installed on my Linux computer, and I'm not going to cover installing it on like a Windows uh, or a Linux desktop with a UI on it, such as Pop OS, because, well, you can do it very simply. You just do the install, which that process is going to be the same whether you're doing this on a Linux server or you're doing this on a uh, Pop! OS like I did on mine. The difference is when you do it on a Linux server, if you don't have a UI installed, I'm going to cover the steps in which you can easily get to it without having to go through uh, things like a reverse proxy. When you do have a UI installed, it just binds to localhost 127.0.1.8384 and uh, pretty simple. It to get to it. So here's all the different files and documents I sync and I've got it loaded on my computer that's running Pop! OS right now. So we'll go ahead and close that So uh, we're going to cover it as far as features and stuff of actually getting it set up from scratch. So here I am on the Windows computer. It's a virtual machine running inside of my systems. I don't usually use Windows, but for the demo of this, I wanted to set it up in Windows first and then we'll set it up in Linux. So here is the SyncThing GTK cross-platform wrapper. It's kind of a nice one. There's a couple different options or you can completely run it from the command line in Windows as well and just use the browser. Uh, but I've already loaded the SyncThing GTK one here. It's pretty straightforward, small load. And we type in sync. We'll pull up the app. And what this will let you do is you can use it with this little app window right here instead of it's just a wrapper for the browser one and if you still want to use the browser you can you can go open web interface and here it is now the first thing about sync thing by default out of the box linux or windows it only binds to localhost what that means is um, the ip address of this computer will not allow the interface to manage sync thing to be accessible you have to be local on the computer that's why when we get to the steps of installing this on a linux server you'll see that we have to do a couple things to make it accessible outside there once you have access to the admin though there is the option to and this is cross-platform. It's the same either way. Oh, not here. Open up the wrong window. Actions, uh, settings, and you can choose to create a username, password, and change the listen address for the UI here. So I could change the listen address to be a specific IP address. So it's 
bound there. That way it would allow it to be accessible outside of there. Maybe you want that, maybe you don't, but there's something, you know, it is an option to do that. So if you didn't want it just listening on localhost, but it will give you a warning. And of course, one of the options too is to use HTTPS, which is a good idea if you're using it outside of localhost. You'll get warnings that if you do this, you could potentially be exposing this. And for example, let's say you wanted to host this in a, uh, maybe a digital ocean droplet, if you expose the UI, um, you now have a potential attack surface where people could poke at it. So uh, that's just something to think about whenever you're setting it up. Obviously, it's less of a risk if it's on a private network, uh, but it's not something you necessarily need to do. And when we get to the Linux side, I'll cover that. But it is completely changeable right here once you have the UI fired up. So we have this default folder that is uh, not really shared. And we'll, where is this at? This is under uh, user Tom Sync. It's easy enough to add another folder. So let's go and add one. Uh, folder label, documents. And uh, we can give it a folder name. Tom's Windows Documents. And uh, it defaulted figuring out I must want to call it documents. But if you wanted to uh, have subfolders and things like that, that's absolutely an option on there. So let me just look at the folder structure. Downloads, documents. Yeah, that seems like a good place to have it. So. That should work. All right, so we'll leave it like that and we'll just hit save. So that should save those documents. Now the default folder is just the uh, user Tom sync. I don't really need it. So we're gonna go ahead and edit and remove it. Yep, I don't really need that one. And this one's not shared yet. And we'll get to how to do the sharing in a second. We have to set up another system for that. So if we edit this, we have the folder the sharing, we'll get to that when we have some device share with file versioning. There's a lot of different options in here and you can choose this on each individual sync thing system. So I can say there's versioning on this one, but maybe not versioning in my cloud one, or maybe I want all the versioning done in the cloud one, but not locally. And what the versioning means is anytime there's a file change, do we keep that old version of the file? Uh, simple file versioning, staggered file versioning. There's a lot of different options in here. So files move to .st versions directory when replaced by deleted. And maybe we want to clean those out after 10 days. So that we 100, so we'll change it to 10. So every 10 days, clean these out, or maybe 30 days, clean these out. This allows you to every time there's a change, because you yeah, remember all these changes, the way sync thing works, is it's changed across all the sessions that are shared for this Tom's folder. When we have it shared within our system, we'll be able to edit that on an individual basis. Then we have Simple file versioning. Files are moved to a date stamp in a .st versions directory where they're replaced or deleted by sync thing. Just keep five versions of every file. Uh, stagger versioning. Files are moved to a date stamp version with ST versions and replaced or deleted with sync thing. Versions are automatically deleted if you're older than a max days. So you can have a versioning path. And uh, it even has a, if you want to get real advanced, you can set up external file versioning. So uh, you can get really deep in here and say things like execute this command and uh, do these functions whenever someone deletes a file. So there's more options you can do. For now, we're going to say actually on the local computers, I usually don't do versioning. I usually save the versionings for the server, but it's here. Ignore patterns. If you have some specific file, you want to back up everything in a folder, except it's got file matching patterns that say don't match this, don't match that. And uh, they have full documentation, of course, on the different ways you can do prefixes and uh, comments for creating special patterns to ignore. So if you're doing a very active folder if you're doing this and we've got clients that have set this up to synchronize different computers uh, that have unusual files in there but they only want certain ones backed up they just create uh, ignore patterns in there scanning watch for changes generally you can leave this at default but if you want you have the option to change the rescan intervals and send receive receive only and maybe you want this to only ever receive but never send or uh, if you set it to send only um, no version changes that happen on the other systems. If someone were to edit a file, it won't come back over here. This can be kind of a good for backup. So if you set up this as a server, uh, if, or if you were load this on a server where you have it dropping backup files, but you never want those backup files pushed back, you just want them to always send. That way, if anything ever happens to the other end of the receiver, no one can sit delete and it would synchronize the delete change across there. Uh, you can set this up to send only. Same thing with receive only. Um, so you kind of get the idea. All those are options on here. So we're going to leave it at send and receive. We're going to leave the file versioning off and uh, just call it documents and save and we're good to go. So now we need to have something to connect it to. Now a couple ways this connects and we're going to go here and go to the settings. And we have connections, NAT traversal, global discovery, local discovery, relay. What these are is they do have a global discovery server. You can go ahead and tell this system to uh, relay through 
like UPnP. So if you've done this in a very basic setup and your firewall supports UPnP, this will actually talk to your firewall and open that up. Now I'm using um, PFSense, which doesn't have that turned on by default and I don't recommend turning it on. It's not a necessity to do this. It just has some options for uh, doing that. It also has the auto discovery and global relay servers. Now those are there relay servers that they're running. What this does is creates the discoverability if you're trying to get two different systems uh, that are not on the same network to find each other. It has local discovery when they're on the same network, but if they're not on the same network, um, you can use their global relay system to find other sync thing servers based on the ID you put in there. So you can have two separate systems and rely on them to relay. Uh, for purposes of the way we're going to do this, we're going to show you that we can do it with all of this turned off, even though we're going to set this up on somewhat separate networks, because uh, we, I'm going to show you how to do everything on a manual discovery because if your goal is to lock every down and keep this completely private so to speak where you implicitly list each system that you want to go to uh, and you don't want this you know beaconing out the fact that it exists at all you can turn all of these off and it'll still work you just have to manually specify each address when you do that so it's up to you which way you want to go uh, i'm going to go for the manual method because the auto one is auto and it's pretty easy. I like it, but uh, we're going to go for more privacy where I want no announcement that this server exists. So save and whenever you save a configuration change, hit restart. And simultaneously, it's going to be restarting in here. These are just one and the same with yours in the GTK one. Uh, so however you want to do it, the GTK one, like I said, is kind of cool if you like it, but because it's going to have a nice little tray thing down here um, at the bottom. So you'll be able to see that pretty straightforward. All right. Now let's get over to our Linux setup so we can uh, tie this to another one. Now you can tie Windows to Windows. You could tie this uh, to a Windows server if you want. You don't have to do anything in Linux. Um, it's just, I figured Linux to Windows is probably more likely what people are going to do. So this covers both sides of that. All right, so back over here to the downloads page, we have um, all the different ones we can download directly, the images. But what we're going to do here, because I'm on Debian, is I want to go ahead and add the repository in here. And what this does is allows me to pull directly from their package base that SyncThing maintains. So if I add this in here, I'm gonna get the latest version of it each time. So every time I do an apt update, uh, it'll be the latest version. Now this is a Debian 10 Buster that I have set up just for SyncThing. And one of the things about it, and by the way, just so we are clear from networking standpoint, this is 192.168.3.200. You'll see that come up a few times. Uh, that's the IP address design here. And I can just install SyncThing. So if I do install, it is in the Debian repository, except it's going to be a slightly older version. That's why we're going to go ahead and follow these instructions right here, curl-s and pull the latest keys and install theirs. This is just going to... Um, allow us to have the latest and greatest version, it just so it's all the way completely up to date. Now I am running this as root, so we're going to do it this way. I'm just taking out the sudo that they have on there. So if you are installing this as root and you don't have sudo set up or you don't need sudo because of your configuration, do that. If you do need sudo, leave it in there. And this is the same when I installed on Pop! OS. I do use sudo because I install it as that particular user. So I'm installing it on my workstation. I just, I did have that in there. So copy paste, then we're going to add this. Next line. And the same thing here. We're not going to take sudo, but if you're doing this on like Pop! OS or Ubuntu um, in the UI version, so to speak, if you're running as a user, leave the sudo in there. So that allowed us to put sync thing in there. And then from there, the next part of the instructions are pretty simple. Applicate update, applicate install sync thing. So let's go ahead and update this. You have the latest packages and we're going to go, whoops, install Thinks sync thing. All right, sync things installed. Next step is going to be adding a user for sync thing to run as. You can run sync thing as root. This is not the best method to do this. The reason why is if something ever happened with sync thing, someone compromised sync thing, it's running at root level privilege. Therefore, whoever gains control of your sync thing instance would also gain control of root level access to your system. So I don't recommend running sync thing as root. Not that you can't, it's just for security reasons, maybe not. So from here, the next step is going to be add user sync thing. User sync thing. That way we have a user to run it as. Give it them a password. The, oh, I think I typed that wrong. Yep.
Yes, and I will be putting instructions on uh, step by step on how to do this within the uh, forums where this video will be posted as well. My forums, so you'll find a link to that at the bottom of this video, so you can actually copy and paste these. But it's add user sync thing. Uh, then the next thing you know, you we need to do, and we'll put this in here is. System control enable sync thing at sync thing dot service. What we told it to do was enable a service to start at sync thing user and sync thing the process. What this does, and we're going to go ahead and start it now. Sync thing start sync thing service. Now we've kicked off the sync thing stat service status or service running. And we'll do a status right here. And all I did was sync thing system control status, that's the command right here. And we can see it's up and running. Now, this is where the challenge comes in because this is a, you know, a Debian server with no UI. So it says the API is listening at 127.0.0.1.8384, the default port. And I can just go there by doing this, but I can't. And even though the IP address of this is 192.168.2.3.200, and for those wondering, yes, I'm using Tmux. We're going to go ahead and telnet over here, and we'll telnet to 192.168.3.200, and we're going to go 8384, connection refused. So how do we get to the UI? Well, that's where we're going to use SSH forwarding to make this work. So we're actually going to exit out, and we're going to set a local listening port of 8,000, and we're going to listen localhost 8384. Now, you could put 8384 twice, like to listen at 8384 and wrap 8384, but the problem you run into if you do that is I have sync thing already running on my computer, and I would end up with a conflict, so we don't really want that. So you can do this if you're using Windows and you have the Windows subsystem for Linux loaded. This will work in Windows. You can SSH in uh, to that particular server and do this same command, and it works the same way. If you're using PuTTY, look up how to do port mapping on PuTTY to do the local remote ports on PuTTY and it's local and follow kind of this idea how to do it. But I'm not a big fan. I used to use PuTTY, I don't use it anymore for forever ago. And because Windows has a bash built in, if you load bash, this works perfectly fine to do this. But you can do this, you can look up how to do the port, um, the SSH porting in PuTTY as an option. And you may have noticed too, I'm not using a password login, I'm using SSH keys. Uh, goes beyond the scope of this to explain SSH keys, but it is the function I'm using to make this work. But what we did though, was we had SSH listen at port 8000, wrap it to this system's local host 8384, and log into root at 192.168.3.200. So now we're loaded in a sync thing. What that did, like I said, this works in both Windows and Linux, is I'm now able to go to HTTP colon slash slash localhost 8000 and it lets me into this particular server. So as long as my SSH session is open, I can get into sync thing and I'm able to get in here to start configuring, setting things up. And it's running as user sync thing, so it works great. And we'll do the same things here. We're gonna go into the settings and uh, connections, and we'll turn off all this because we're not gonna use any of the relaying, local discovery, global discovery. We're not gonna do any of that in here. Uh, just hit save. It'll wanna restart. So just like it, just like it is in Windows, it's one and the same when you're using the web UI here. So I'm in here and now I want to add that folder from the Windows system over to here. So how do we get that in there? Well, go back over here to our Windows session and we want to add a remote device. We need the device ID from it. And then we need a device name and then we're gonna to need to fill in where that where it lives. Okay, pretty easy enough. So the device ID, action, show ID. Just do a copy. Device ID. Give it a name. Sharing, we're gonna go ahead and share my documents folder. Advanced, like I said, we're not using the discovery, so we're gonna go and do this via TCP. So we type in TCP colon slash slash 192.168.3.200 colon 2200. That is the default port. Now port 2200 is open. There's nothing special we have to do on that. If you were to install this into a cloud server and like I said, a DigitalOcean droplet, for example, port 2200 would absolutely uh, 
be open to the public, but all that's encrypted, the whole transport layer and everything. And the way that this connects is first, we have to have that device ID. So it's not like any random stranger can talk to uh, the port, I'm uh, sorry, not 2200, 22,000. Uh, sorry, I read that wrong. Uh, so port 22,000 cannot be talked to by any stranger. They have to have the device ID. How do we get the device ID? We had to get it this long key right from the server and paste it in here. And even then that doesn't mean they automatically get access. So what we did was we saved it and we said, share it with this remote device here. I'm gonna go switch back over to it. And now this new device that had our key that we gave it, would you like to add this device? This is another layer of protection. Where'd that come from? 192.168.3.9, it lets me know the port that it came from, yes. So we're gonna go ahead and confirm and save it. Device ID, desktop, and we can rename it here if we want. Uh, Windows computer and hit save. Now this is normal. There's a pause after you do this. It restarts and pauses and it sometimes takes about 20, 30 seconds. There's going to be a prompt where it wants to say, hey, it wants they want to share a folder with you. How do you want to handle the sharing of this folder? So we're going to give it a second here. There's our Windows computer wants to share folder documents. Tom, Windows documents, add new folder. Yes, we'd like to add it. Where would you like to put this? Well, these are Tom's Windows documents. And we'll go ahead and see that it says home sync thing. So this is a standard Linux file path naming scheme. Um, no problem. Save. Same thing with file versioning. We want some file version. Let's put just simple trash can file versioning and we'll keep them for 30 days because this is going to be the server that we save everything on. Not worried about advanced and all those ones are the same options again. Now we save it. Once again, there's a pause. It's disconnected. And the reason it's disconnected is it's got to think, resave this, and after about 10, 15 seconds, it'll reconnect, and then the files will be saved in there. And we've set up two-way synchronization that quickly in here. But let's talk about how that works now that we have things synchronized. Well, once this once this sets up, we'll go over here. This is up to date. Well, there's nothing really to update, so we need to probably put some uh, documents in there. So let's drop this uh, test document in there. Copy, paste. There's our test.txt, some test document that I am changing. Save. And then we'll rename this one uh, test2. There we go. We got test1, test2.txt. Uh, simple enough. So two documents some uh, a second there we go test document save close all right and if we look rescan give it a second make sure it's all up to date all right let's look over our other system all those files probably are synchronized yeah this one's up to date up to date yeah updated test 2.txt we can look at the versions of it so we can see that there's more than one version of this. Let's go and edit them again and see what happens. So, so just so we have some more data. So we're gonna open up this file. Some more changes. So that one's is Anna changing again. Whoops, I think I spelled again wrong, whatever. All right, close that document. And I'll probably drag something else. Let me see if there's something else on this computer I can even copy over there. Anything in the downloads folder so we can actually have some data. Okay, we'll copy the installer over here too, so. All right, so we drop some things over there. We'll go back over to our other system here. and it's synchronizing and up to date. We can go look at the versions. Now, because we are just doing the simpler trash can versioning, there's only one version. It doesn't keep all the versions of it. So I can restore these original ones, but it doesn't have all the versions back. So what if we wanted to change that? That's the reason they have a couple different ones. Let's go back over here to the file versioning and we'll change it to 
just simple versioning and keep five versions of it. So files are moved, date stamped with ST versions. With trash can versioning, all it will do is let me restore the one recent change, but not all the revisions of changes on there. So that's why I wanted to demo why I changed it a couple times. Even though I did those different changes, it only has the one. Now, the nice thing is, and we'll go ahead back over here real quick. We have this one and we're going to delete it. And it's now deleted. And even with trash can versioning, so we can go over here, let's rescan. And we'll go back over here to versions. And we have the ability to restore it. And if we hit restore, we're restoring it. Are you sure you want to restore one file? We restore it here. It'll take a second and uh, can refresh it by hitting rescan. Took a second, here we go. Now that file just got pushed back. So you can kind of get the idea of how that works. Now let's change the versioning type. So we'll go ahead and uh, edit this one. File versioning, and we're gonna say, just simplify file versioning. We're gonna keep five versions of the files. So let's go back and edit those text files. Disconnect it, it's gonna think for a second and restart. Each time you make these changes, there's like a restart and a pause. But while we're waiting for that, let's go ahead and Make a completely new version. Simple version. Simple revisions. Revision two, save. Give it a second to synchronize. If you do change them faster than the synchronization happens, well then it's not gonna catch it. So we'll give it a second to synchronize here and jump back. Make sure it's seen on this side. Yep, right there, updated simple revisions. So now we're gonna go ahead and make this one revision three now, save. I'll just hit rescan so it kind of forces it to synchronize. Cool, I go to, you go over here, you go to uh, recent changes and you can see, all right, there's two different versions of the file. Now what happens when we hit versions? Well, we can go here and there's the other one to restore. So now we have different versions of that file we can restore. Let's change it one more time and it should show me even more versions of that file to restore. So we've only got two right now. So we'll call this one now revision four. And now we can restore these other versions. So there's the version we initially started with, revision two, revision four. So revision four is current, so we don't have that one showing in here. Revision three is if we restored this, and revision two if we restored this one. And the same thing, it'll just overwrite the file and it'll cascade backwards to actually everywhere this is shared. We're only doing this between two systems, so there's only two to share it with. But you kind of get the idea that you can do these different version types on there and it's pretty easy to use. Now, as far as how this system goes, so when we look at this, how it relates back. So it has the device ID, the sharing, advanced, address dynamic. That's on our server side right here. What that means is dynamically that other system can come to any address. And we're assuming our server is always at a fixed address, 192.168.3.200. But our other system here can be at any address. So if our Windows computer is wandering around or really any computer, that's one of the reasons I chose to have the connection initiate from this particular system to the server. This is how we set ours up. I have a server that's at a static address all the time. Even if that address is behind a VPN, um, for example, and that's we run ours, even though it's an encrypted protocol, we still keep it behind a VPN, uh, you know, just for good safekeeping and less risk exposure when you have things behind a VPN. So when I have my laptop roaming around out in the field, I do have sync thing on it. I'm running Linux on there. Um, and I VPN in and it connects then back into that particular server all the time. It doesn't matter where my laptop is. Um, if my laptop changes address, it doesn't really matter as long as the server has a static address. That's why we initiated the connection there. But the question I've seen people ask is, can you initiate the connection either way? And the answer is always yes. You could have started the server to connect it to, to a desktop. The problem you run into is if the desktop changes, the servers are statistically, depending on how you're configuring things, but statistically, usually servers are going to be a static address. And especially if you want to run this in the cloud, let's say you're going to throw this in DigitalOcean, you'll get a static address on a DigitalOcean droplet. And no matter where your IP address comes from, if you initiated it to 
the server and did the, you know, connecting to specifically uh, TCP, your server IP address, colon 2200, you're fine to do that. And if you do run this in a server on the cloud, you're not going to really have a problem doing it in terms of uh, security. As of right now, it's a pretty well vetted protocol. It's very open. It's open source. Um, they're using proper implementation of TLS. It's been gone through. I don't know if they've gone through a full code audit, but it looks pretty secure overall. That being said, this is still why I keep it behind a VPN in case someone discovers a flaw. There are people who have lots of publicly discoverable uh, port 22,000s out there and changing a port security through obscurity doesn't really work. People can still find it. And if someone figures out that particular uh, port and finds out that this system uh, has some flaw in it, that would obviously possibly create a problem for you. Um, but once it's all set up and running, it's pretty straightforward to do here. Now, last little thing we're going to cover is just to show you the reverse issue. So right here, we're we are logged into sync thing and uh, we'll actually go to SU. We'll change to user sync thing here. And there's the Tom's Windows documents and there's those files and simple versions.test. Uh, and if we did this, we're going to CP test two to test three dot text. Oops. A second test document. Actually, this is going to be a third one. And uh, it edited in Vim. There we go. Now I've edited it on this computer. The same thing applies, just so you know, because we have two-way synchronization. So even though I edited this document in Linux, it's now going to show up. If I go over here, whoops, back. There's that test three and edit it in Vim. So it's two-way synchronization. But the reason I did that was because we don't have any type of revisioning here. Anything I change on here will not necessarily be revisioned because it was revisioned on the source server coming back. So something else to consider when you're doing that. I usually don't have revisioning, as I said, on my endpoints because that's where uh, I'm making the file changes. I have the server holding the revisions. Um, you may, if you have, you're have, you working with documents and let's say you're sharing with another user and you want to use this, well, in that case, you may want to have revisioning on both devices. It all depends on how much space you have and have available on there. But it's pretty easy to set these up. It's pretty easy to add another folder. It's even easier to add a folder, like we'll add our downloads folder. Add the downloads folder, Tom, downloads. And you can just check the box, save. Now we've added one more folder. It's gonna do the restart and disconnect. And we go back over here to this machine and it'll just prompt us to add the next folder. And away we go. Windows computer wants to share folder downloads, add new folder, we'll say yes. Where do we wanna put it? I think I can leave everything at default uh, from Windows, just why not? And it's gonna create that file folder here. And we go over here. and download from Windows. Away we go, we now have that folder. I don't know if there's anything in there or if it may not have synced yet. Yeah, I don't see anything in there just yet. It does the same thing up to date. Then this is gonna synchronize after a few seconds here and away we go. So that's it for getting started with SyncThing and how it works. It's pretty straightforward to use once you kind of get the concept of how to connect these two devices. It is fairly secure. And when I exit out of here, we're gonna exit out of this and exit out of this. It does hang right here. I hit control C. The reason it hung is because I left this open and now I don't have access to it. Now, I've seen a few other people, and the last comment I'll have on this is someone says, why not set up a reverse proxy with it, or why not just bind it to the um, IP address so you can access it remotely? Absolutely, you can do either one of those things. Reverse proxies, I've seen a lot of people suggest that for same thing. It has its own SSL transport layer for the web interface as well for the UI. So I don't feel like a reverse proxy is needed, but of course, if you wanted to do something like uh, not have a self-signed certificate, well, yeah, reverse proxy would do it, or I've done a video on PFSense and HA proxy, and it works uh, through that as well. But but from a security standpoint, when you're setting your server, unless you're really changing things a lot, it's usually go through the setup process, get it locked down. Um, you're minimizing your exposure by only binding it to localhost and only doing it this way I have right here, this SSH with the local port versus uh, the port forwarding through SSH. 
doing it this way, in my opinion, it reduces your threat service, especially if you plan on putting this in a cloud somewhere. And if you want to have it exposed, now the only thing you'll need exposed in your cloud is one, the port 22000 and two, SSH. Just those two things um, open are the only ports you would need open on an external uh, server to be able to get to this, like, like I said, a digital ocean droplet, for example. So as a pretty solid use case, it's a pretty good way to keep this secure. And one of the reasons I like SyncThing, and I've talked about this before, is the threat surface is very, very small and even smaller if you're doing it behind a VPN. I've been using it for a number of years. It works really, really well. Um, it does work, of course, in FreeNAS. It's a plug-in in FreeNAS, so that's another way you can get this going and set up. They have it set up as so you can run it in a jail. And that's another frequently popular place you can put it where you can uh, build out your storage and have a very large system as far as uh, backing it up. As a matter of fact, that is how we do it. Even my video synchronization is done with sync thing. So I can synchronize videos between systems um, as they're created. They get moved over to other systems and replicated and revised in case I accidentally goof up and delete a video. Um, I keep so many days worth of revisions. I keep it simple because uh, of the size of video <laughs> files, but it will scale. It does handle quite a bit of documents and it's a fairly lightweight service to keep running in the background and being cross compatible makes it pretty great. All right. And I'll, once again, all these instructions and the step-by-steps I will put in the forums. Um, so there'll be a link in the bottom of this video to our forums where I'll have all the step-by-step instructions for getting this set up and how I did it. Thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos. They're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.